being heard on that community activist, the one and only Georgia Allen. Well, hello, hello, hello. I was look, looking, I was like, who is that pretty lady? Hey, <laughs> I'm trying to say, hey, no, I had to put it up there first. <laughs> I love looking at the different photos because I never know which one you're going to put up. So I'm always like, I wonder which one he's going to put up today. Yeah, yeah. So I try to, you know, you know mix it up. Yeah. Taking some more, you know, just, a little jazz, jazzy, a little flavor. <laughs> You know, so and that's good, that's good, that's what we need. In today's time, that is exactly what we need. You gotta and have so, comedy relief, <laughs> <laughs> comedy relief, exactly. Mm -hmm. I am so excited, as always, to come on and share with our listening audience. So, I bring you greetings. I am Georgia F. Allen, and each week we have a conversation for information, a conversation for correction, as well as a conversation for transformation. This is our weekly information show called GA for Just Is, because it just is the right thing to do. Hello. So with that being said, I just want to let you know our topic today is education excellence, education equity. And I'm going to open up a little differently than I normally do. I'm going to share a little reading from someone who uh, speaks to education equity, because we hear all of these different things going on with regards to equity and whether or not this is equitable or not equitable and on and on and on. Um, the reason why we're doing education excellence and education equity is because yesterday, yesterday was 69 years of Brown, since Brown v. Board of Education. 69 years. So we want to commemorate the um, separate but equal is unconstitutional. We had the fights, uh, it went to the Supreme Court and ultimately uh, the Supreme Court ruled when our, the Honorable, the Honorable Thurgood Marshall went before she, What happened? Are you still there? Let me take the call and come back on. We'll be right back right after this important message hold on for a moment uh technical difficulties whenever you okay she went off maybe she'll snap back on let me give her a minute Due to technical difficulties, we'll be right back in a moment with Georgia Allen, community activist, and uh, we'll be reaching our topic today. Stand by. We'll be right back with uh, with your host, Georgia Allen, community activist. This is a slight technical difficult uh, difficulty. We, we'll see if she lost, you know, the brief moment of, uh, she should pop back on in a minute. So until then, stand by for a brief moment.
Two technical digital cover. We'll be right back in about two minutes. Two minutes. We'll be back live with the GA for Justice, Georgia Allen. We'll be right back in a moment. Stay tuned. Okay. We are back. We are back. We are back. <laughs> you know, technical difficulties. Hey, you know, they don't want us. They, I keep trying to explain to people about this situation with stuff. They don't want us to come together because it's hard to stop us when you're getting knowledge. They will stop that in a minute. Welcome back. I'm sorry about the difficulties with the, uh, with the, uh, technical difficulties with the uh, Facebook or whatever. But Georgia is back. Your community activist, Georgia Allen. Well, hello, hello, hello. They don't like Brown versus Board of Education? It, yeah, is that I'm, what they're trying to say to us? Really, that they I'm do really not like Brown versus Board of Education? Well, I declare, yeah. who would have thought <laughs> they're talking about education excellence and education equity would be an issue. Now, I do have an issue because I was going to speak from the uh, recording that I had on my phone. Uh -huh. <laughs> so trying to, to give you what I wanted to is a little bit of a challenge unless I go off the screen, pull up my other information and then come back. No so if you were... If you will allow me to pause, put my face up, and then I'm going to read, and then I'm going to come back oh, oh, live. Yeah, we can do that. Okay? Yeah. If they, if they cut you off, then they, they, I think they might think you're trying to get on this uh, uh, the, uh, the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
okay, we, you know, there can be a little bit of confusion as it pertains to equity. Equity in education is often misunderstood. Frequently, I hear or read about equity in education as ensuring all students have the opportunity to go to a school that offers instruction in literacy, mathematics, technology, and all the other content areas, along with advanced courses to enroll in if they so desire. While there can be no equity if not every child has an opportunity for an education, opportunity is insufficient to create equity. Equity is providing whatever it takes, listen now, whatever it takes for each child to master the rigorous standards set by each state. And remember, they can travel from state to state because their parents can be in the military. So education may be different. This means that some children will require more support and instructions than others. So keep that in mind as I talk to you today about education, both excellence and equity. I am back live. <laughs> I am back live. Were they able to hear that okay? Were you yes. able to hear that okay? Fantastic. Okay. This is what we're going to talk about today. 69 years ago, yesterday, uh, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Brown v. Board of Education. I believe that as a community, it is critically important that we keep that front and center, not just on May 17th, but throughout the entire month of May. Our children need to know their history and their history cannot, doesn't just have to be taught in school. Their history can be taught in their homes. Their history can be taught on Sundays at church. Their history can be taught in community events throughout. Brown v. Board of Education um, uh, took place at a time when segregation was front and center in every area of our lives, whether it was going to a store, whether it was um, getting a hot dog at a concession stand. All of these things at that period of time affected us as a community. And so something needed to be done. Over time, we have debates as to whether or not everything was done in the correct order, but everything was done to the best that it could be done for that period of time. Now, are there things that we can do now? Probably so. And that is up to us. We cannot continue to hold hostage our people, our ancestors, we need to hold ourselves accountable for here and now. For those of you who don't know, the lawsuit was uh, enabled by the NAACP. And so we want to salute the NAACP or the NAACP for all its efforts in helping to end institutional racism. I should say somewhat defeated. We haven't completely defeated it. There's still work to be done, but we must recognize that education must be an enduring commitment to excellence. Not only are we looking for equity, which means that in, in terms of equity, it cannot be just one size fit all. It has to be a combination of things. If one child comes into the school, school system and he has more issues than another child, then there has to be a way that you can give that child a little more attention in order to help them reach a level playing field. That is part of what has to take place. And that's why when I open up with that message, the um, former school teacher was letting us help us to understand, I should say, was helping us to understand that equity is not this little a uh, crystal ball. <laughs> you put the crystal ball in the room and all of a sudden everybody has equity. That is not the case. There are children from all walks of life and all different circumstances and they all require something different. 
And therefore, in order for them to reach their highest level of expectations, and we do have to have expectations for our young people, then there has to be some changes that place, takes place in order to reach that level of equity so that all children can succeed and all children can perform and do well. Okay, the lawsuit um, that was determined unconstitutional in the Brown v. Board of Education case, it also included, in addition to Topeka, Topeka, Kansas, it also included lawsuits for South Carolina, Virginia, and Delaware. And one of the reasons why I wanna uh, mention uh, Virginia is because right here in our local area, in Hampton Roads area, in the city of Norfolk, we had what we call, we have what we call the Norfolk 17. And because this is Brown v. Board of Education, I want to commemorate those 17 young people who were willing to stand up and integrate those schools, even though they face all types of hostility, all types of discrimination in every shape or form. And these are grown people yelling at children, the mamas and daddies of the kids that are in this school over here that hadn't been integrated. When these black children, the North of 17 came to those schools, do you know those, those parents <laughs> got off their jobs? <laughs> the preachers came out of their churches and they stood there screaming and yelling at children who wanted to have the same school books, the same opportunities as anyone else because their parents were paying taxes just like anybody else. So I'm gonna take a moment to mention those names because I think it's so important that we don't ever forget those who knock down barriers and open up doors for us. So the Norfolk 17, Lewis Cousins, Olivia Driver, Lavera Forbes, Patricia Godbolt, Alvaraz Frederick Gonsalon, <laughs> Andrew Heidelberg, Dolores Johnson, Edward Jordan, Lalita Portis, Betty Jean Reed, Johnny Rouse, Geraldine Talley, James Turner Jr., Patricia Turner, Carol Wellington, Claudia Wellington, and Reginald Young, the Norfolk 17. We don't want to forget our history. I don't care how much they call it CRT. I call it, it is the country's real truth. Whether they like it or not, it is their real truth. This history of, of America, um, instead of using this critical race theory uh, terminology that they want to use, uh, even though it's a, it's a, um, a lesson in, in uh, higher education, sometimes you have to flip things on his head. Even Jesus recognized that he had to flip the table over when people were gambling in the temple. Even Jesus realized that he needed to flip the table over when people were stealing and lying and cheating. Well, we're living in a similar situation. So sometimes we have to flip the table over. So with Brown versus Board, Board of Education, the table had to be flipped over. Um, Mr. Oliver Brown, whose daughter, Miss Linda Brown, uh, wanted he wanted a better education for his daughter. And so that's how it began. They were in Topeka, Kansas. And he was like, you know what? They're providing uh, resources and uh, materials. They're providing uh, more quality at that school than they are at ours. Again, we're still paying taxes. But yet you go into this schoolhouse over here and this schoolhouse over here and they have science and technologies and, and all types of social media and various things in this school over here, but they don't have it over here. So even way back in the 1950s, parents, our parents saw that there was a big gap between what was happening in their school with us receiving books that had been passed down for years <laughs> from one from one um, school's year to the next we were getting old raggedy books and then the other 
school over here got brand new books, but they said their children were so much smarter and so much brighter and so much this. Well, you had a different book. We weren't learning in the same book you were learning in. So this is why Board, uh, Brown v. Board of Education was so very important and why it was so important for persons who felt the need to fight on behalf of their children to be willing to put their put themselves on the line, put their children on the line and be willing to use their name in a lawsuit. And again, the lawsuit was a combination of people. It wasn't just this one young lady. It's just that part of what they do a lot of times in uh, lawsuits is because Brown was the earlier part of the alphabet, was the second letter in the alphabet. They just felt it had a nicer ring, Brown v. Board of Education versus one of the other names of students that was there. So uh, ultimately, they were able to take this case to court. They were all able to take it all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. And uh, the Honorable Thurgood Marshall being the tough <laughs> litigant that he was, he took it all the way and he won along with the team of people. And so we want to make sure that we don't ever forget the Charles Hamilton Houston, the Third Good Marshall, the Oliver Hill, all of those men and um, the Patty Murray, those women that fought along with these gentlemen to do something that was in our best interest. And now that that I've shared that with you. I also want to share with you the names of the Little Rock Nine. Many of you might remember the Little Rock Nine. There was a movie about the Little Rock Nine. And I want to call out their names too, because I think it's so very important. I'm doing this show simply to commemorate Brown v. Board of Education, to celebrate those who are willing to put themselves on the firing line. And that's basically what it was because those were some mean and nasty people who did, did those things to our children. And the Little Rock Nine was Mr. Ernest Green, Miss Minnie Jean Brown. And I love Minnie Jean because Minnie Jean wasn't taking any stuff. I watched her over and over again. She was not taking any stuff. Miss Elizabeth Eckford, Thelma Mothershed, um, can't read my own writing, Melba, Melba Patillo, Gloria Ray, Terrence Roberts, Jefferson Thomas, and Collada Walls. Um, I know that we've lost, at my last check-in, we lost one of the Little Rock Nine uh, when I checked, and then I believe we've lost five of the Norfolk 17. So we want to um, use this time to just pay homage to them and to thank them for being willing to put their name on the line. We also want to be thankful to people like Ruby Bridges, little six-year-old that was mistreated just because she wanted an education, a fair education, an equitable education, mistreated. Miss Linda Brown, another ed, uh, young lady, um, who was the, the person behind Brown v. Board of Education. She wanted an education. For some reason, there are people out here that don't believe that everybody should receive a quality education, a equitable education, an ex education of excellence, but we do. And now the next step is <laughs> we gotta ask ourselves, do we really want an equitable education? Do our children, are we teaching our children to want equity in education? Do we want excellence in education? Are we talking to our children about excellence? Not just getting by, not just passing a grade, but excellence. Because prior to us, these young people, they wanted excellence. They want ex equity, but they also want excellence. You will find that many of these people went on to get degrees in all different areas. They, um, many of them went on to teach. Um, and so they became very successful, some business owners. But somehow, somewhere along the line, 
this generation and those that came before, you know, um, from the, what is it? The millennials, the Gen Z, the Gen Xs, and on and on and on, somehow kind of got lost in this education piece. Now, don't get me wrong. We have some phenomenal young students. We see them on Facebook all the time receiving $10 million in scholarships. We see them all the time getting accepted to hundreds of colleges. They apply to all these different colleges and they have like a 98% success rate in being accepted. But we also still have an issue with excellence in that we still have our young people in some instances who feel like if they're smart, then they're not gonna be cool. So we as parents, we as leaders, we as faith, people of faith, we need to bring back being cool to be educated. We need to bring back um, how being successful can also uh, lead you to being a business owner. Because part of the problem is we keep hearing over and over and over and over again, go to school, get a good job. We need to make sure that we don't just focus on just getting a good job. We also wanna focus on owning the business. Education is not just about getting a job, good job. Education is also about owning the business and hiring people for the jobs. So today, as we commemorate Brown v. Board of Education, let's shout out to our young people. Thank you, Teresa. Shout out to our young people. It's okay to be smart. As a matter of fact, you're so smart that you should be the number one person in your school. And and there should be a list of you, one through 300. <laughs> and all of y'all are at the top, at the top of the class, okay? We don't need you to be at the bottom anymore. We need people out here trumpeting the call. There should be a clarion call for our young people to not only be the best, but be the best of the best of the best. So with Brown v. Board of Education, I'm excited. <laughs> Yeah. Henderson will tell you, I'm always excited when I Hello. get to talk about Hello. my folk. Okay. Hello. Hello. No doubt. Did you want to share with us, Henderson? Uh, yes. I mean, it's important. Uh, you know, like I said, the technical difficult stuff comes up whenever we discuss these type of topics. I want to apologize again. There's not nothing on WVDNN or uh, the host, you know activists, uh, community activists, Georgia Allen. It's just the algorithms. When you start talking about, you know, politics, they'll say something's wrong with this system. I've been on the system all week. Ain't nothing been wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but we, our, our youth, you know, today, we, we, we have all this balance and it doesn't make sense. At six years old, a youth got is taking a gun to school to shoot a teacher, or a twelve-year-old, or seventeen-year-old. Who in the world would thought we would be living today in this type of chaos? It's in amazing. It's amazing. You, you you have to ask yourself where where do we drop the ball? And if we did drop the ball, when are we going to pick that ball up? and turn things around because it's on us. The illness is on us to turn things around. We're looking at equity. We're looking at fair and impartial treatment of our children. That's what we're looking for in equity. We want our children to be treated fairly. When we're looking at excellence, we're looking at outstanding. We're looking at overperforming. We're looking at the best of the best of the best. And so our conversation again, is about education excellence and education equity. And we need them both. It's not either or, it is both. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so with that being said, you know, um, we have to ask our questions, ourselves questions sometimes. Did segregation end or did the institutions create and adjust to a new form of segregation? We need to ask ourselves some questions sometimes. Take a look at the landscape, where you're living, where you live when you grew up, where you're living now. 
and how integrated is the place that you live in now? Even though you may have bought a nice home or you may have done this or you may have done that. Did you notice how slowly, little by little, that area that was very diverse at one point in time just somehow became a segregated community again? And did you notice how when it came to the community becoming more segregated, then the education system did what? It became more segregated. And what else happened? Did you lose dollars? Did those city school board and city council members, did they allocate dollars to those same schools where your children are going or did they suck it out and switch it over to where those folks who left the community and put it in their community? And if they did, are you at school board meetings and saying to them, that's unacceptable? That is unacceptable. My, my uh, shirt that I have on today, it says vote. Well, guess what? We think we're going down there just to vote and press the button uh, to get a president elected. Or we're pressing the button to get a congressional person elected. Or we're pressing the button for the mayor. Well, guess what? You're also pressing the button to get your school board elected to office. And you're pressing the button to determine where the funding is going in your city. Hello. You're pressing the button for all of those things. So with Brown Board of Education, it is about education and it's about education on all levels. It's about education on the political level, the economic level, the education level. It is about education. But it's important, as I said earlier, education must be an enduring commitment and I add it to, to excellence. Somebody said an enduring commitment. I believe it's an enduring commitment, but it should be an enduring commitment to excellence. And that's excellence in all walks of life so that you begin to control and you begin to have power. It's, a, it's really hard to have power when you don't have 50 cents to put on the table to buy a loaf of bread and loaf of bread is no longer 50 cents, right? Okay. So it's a little bit, it's, it's a little troubling, okay? So- I'm speaking to people far and wide because somehow and somewhere along the way, we began to be complacent. And my clarion call today to all of you who are listening, as a civil rights activist, it is our job to educate. That means to give you knowledge. But when we give you knowledge, guess what? It's your job to investigate. I, I, I can't do it all. <laughs> it's your job to research. Yes, I'm going to try to educate you, provide you with some knowledge. But guess what? You also need to do some work. It's also my job to enlighten, to garner enthusiasm, to garner some type of emotion. Because I need you guys to get excited, to get excited about your children to get excited about the next generation. I need you to be enlightened. I need you to be emotional, but I need you to have good emotions. Good emotions that lead to a good result. I also want to be here to encourage you. And that means I need to give you a little bit of push. I can't just let you sit there. <laughs> I can't let, just give you some knowledge. I just can't give you a little emotion, but I got to give you a little bit of a push. So today, as we talk about Brown v. Board of Education, I want you to educate yourself as well. I want you to be enlightened. I want you to get a little bit emotional. I want you to garner some of that doggone emotion that those people before us had to have. They had to get some emotion in order to get out there and be willing to fight on the front lines on our behalf. Because people that uh, fought for us Many of them are no longer here. So there had to be a reason for them to want to fight. And generally speaking, it's generally about emotion. It's either a good emotion or it might be a bad emotion. But nevertheless, it's some type of emotion. You know, they, they might be angry. That emotion might be an anger emotion. But that other emotion may be an emotion of enthusiasm because I want to do more. So I'm emotionally enthusiastic about changing outcomes in my community. And then the last thing I always like to say, I use the three, I use the four E's, is engage. That means, guess what? 
No one person can do all the work. So engage means to get the work. You're going to have to get to work. That means you got to go to school board meetings. You have to go to city council meeting. You can't just sit there. You got to speak up and speak out. Okay. So again, Brown v. Board of Education was about opportunity. It was about access. It was about a, a, a chance. It was about a chance for you to do better than those who came before you. And in 2023, we need to take a look at ourselves and ask ourselves, how many acres of land do we own? Because our forefathers own hundreds, hundreds of acres of land. So if we're not owning hundreds of acres of land, don't we need to come together Hello. and maybe buy some acres of land as a collective and not as an individual? See, because it's so much more important than we operate as a we and not as a me. Mm. <laughs> Brown v. Board of Education. No, I'm not a preacher, okay? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> you was born a preacher's daughter. <laughs> yes, I was. Okay, learning. Are we learning in today's time or are we just puppeting what we hear? We need our children to be learning, okay? not just repeating back enough to pass the test. They need to read that book. They need to decipher that book. They need to go back and research. And, and sometimes they need to challenge what they are learning, but we need to teach them diplomacy, okay? Let me tell you, the best way to get people who don't like you is to whisper. I used to use it all the time in stores because see, when I was younger, there was still quite a bit of segregation going on. And so I would go into stores and there was nobody who was working that looked like me. And so I would ask for something and this, you know, turn and look or whatever. So I'd get up to the counter and lean on the counter and I whispered, do you have that item? And can I take a closer look at it. Oh man, you talking about cringing because she was expecting me to yell at her. Well, guess what? I did totally the opposite. It's called diplomacy. Change what they expect <laughs> to what gives you the power. Hello. Did you guys hear me? Change what your enemy expect. <laughs> to what gives you power. So you learn how to push back against things. That's education. That's knowledge. That's learning. And that's, that's the times that we're in. We're in a time when we're going to have to re-educate our young people so that they're not so frustrated. Brown v. Board of Education was about opening up the doors. But you're going to have to work a little harder to move your children from here to up here because there's absolutely no reason whatsoever that all of our children should not be up here. We just have to talk to them differently. We just have to engage them differently. One of the, one of the best things that you can do in order to help uh, children to be critical thinking thinkers is to go out and find riddles. Let them solve those riddles and let them practice that. And I'm going to tell you, when they solve riddles, you will see that they can solve things in math and they will solve things in science and they will solve things in all areas of schooling because they started to critically think and they're no longer just doing this rote learning. They're, they're like, OK, hmm, OK, so it says this. Well, let me evaluate that. Let me let me discern what they're really trying to tell me. And is what they're telling me the truth? Or do I need to go back and do a little more research and decipher it, write a, a report on it? Write a report on math. Get your kids, get them, when they come home, talk about math and have them write a, a, a report on math and, and why two plus two equal four. 
you know, because when they get in the habit of writing, it also helps them with their brain power. Brown v. Board of Education was not a stopping point. It was a launching pad. Do you hear me? Are you listening? Brown v. Board of Education was not just a starting point. It was a launching pad to launch you further than everybody out here because you're smarter. You know you are. We just need to tell you that more often. Okay. The other thing about education, again, I have my vote sh shirt on this side. <laughs> my vote shirt on just to remind you about voting. As you're coming into the age of voting, because we got young people, we have college, edu college um, students, we have all of these young people. Some of them haven't even registered to vote yet. We need you to register to vote. And then we need you to vote because you're going to start making laws. But you can't make laws if you're not engaged. Let's take a look at folks that we have we have out there now that claim that they're trying to run for president of the United States. Do, do our generation need to write a new law for those who want to run and be congressional people? serve on our courts or serve on our uh, public safety um, forces, whether it's the CIA, the police department, the FBI, any of these things. Do we need to rewrite the laws for who can serve in those positions? Because if we do, to my high school students, I need you to be thinking about that right now. I need you to be thinking about what do you really want to see in terms of someone serving on the police department, the person who's the chief of the police, some of the deputy chiefs, do those people meet the qualifications? They always talk about qualifications. They're not qualified. Well, as educated young people, I need you to write the qualifications. I need you to write. We got people in Congress don't even know what the Constitution is. They spew, spew it all the time. Follow the Constitution. You ask them about <laughs> anything other than than uh the right to bear arms they would know they they don't know anything else in there except for the right to bear arms right well you shouldn't be in congress making over a hundred and i think it's up to a hundred and ninety thousand dollars a year plus um like all types of expenses that you get housing and travel and all of these different things that's your money. That's your money that they're spending. And 90% of the time, this new generation of elected officials came to Washington without one policy agenda whatsoever. So they go in there, they sit in their chairs, they travel back and forth between their districts. Part of that is probably paid for. Some of it may not be. That's your tax dollars, sweetheart. That is your money. They're spending your money living the good life and can't even read half of them. We just saw one young man, you know, got something like, what, seven, nine felony charges against him for lying. If we had had a list of things to say in order to run or be elected to serve in Congress, you have to meet these qualifications. He would not have qualified. He couldn't just run for office just because he, he met the bare minimum, which was the age. So Brown v. Board of Education was uh, a launching pad for you. It was a launching pad for you to do more than what was done, to do more than the minimum. And so I'm excited because I'm hoping that this will be shared far and wide so that people will begin to think differently. So our children will begin to think differently so that we'll operate in a different mode instead of operating in a mode of complacency. 
Complacency does not work for us. It's not a winner. As a matter of fact, all these years of complacency have just caused us to be just barely making it. And many of us should be owning businesses. Look how many people found out all the, all the um, jewels that they had inside of them when COVID hit. Look at them. Some of them didn't have a uh, two or three college degrees to hang on the wall. Because see, everybody doesn't need all of those college degrees. Each person have different skill set. Each person has different gifts. They just needed to identify the gift that they had and use that gift to reach the level of a business owner or to reach that level where they were now educators. Maybe they own their own private school. Maybe it was small. Maybe it's a small school. Maybe it's not a huge school, but they're teaching children what is not being taught in the public school system, and they're teaching them beyond. Um, if the second, if that person is a second grader, they're teaching them third grade information. If they're in the third grade, they're teaching them fourth grade information. So they're moving our children forward faster. Even down to the young man that received all of those scholarships, he was going to college. He was going to high school. He was uh, passing college courses and walked into his first year of college already with college courses intact. So if he can do it, all of our children can do that. Of course. Brown v. Board of Education. Okay. <laughs> I love this subject because we haven't used it to our advantage and we have a responsibility to use the tools that have been given to us to our advantage. But we also have a responsibility to look into reliable sources of information. Check it, research it, <laughs> investigate it. Don't take it at its word. Do some homework, okay? Because we want to make sure that when our kids come out, if, if someone challenges them, they're able and ready to answer the questions. And sometimes, you know what? They don't even need to answer the question. They just need to have the knowledge. And then when the person asks them a question, turn it around and say, and what do you think? Because now you can identify what knowledge they don't even have. So don't feel like you always have to answer questions. That's the one thing that I used to love about reading about Jesus. <laughs> he used to ask people questions all the time. They say, well, stone this person. He said, well, you know, even, even, even if he didn't ask, ask it in a question form, he would make a statement that questioned their behavior. So he said, he, ye without sin cast the first stone. Go ahead. You all that in the bag of chips, do it. <laughs> okay. So he questioned, <laughs> he questioned the individual who was trying to put someone else down. So there's a number of ways that you can ask questions. You can ask questions with statements that challenge what someone is saying to you. But you know what? It takes some time to get there. It doesn't happen overnight, but we have resources available to all of us. We have resources that are ethical resources. Stop running around getting information from folks that have no ethics whatsoever. Stop. Stop it. Stop listening to shows. I mean, I watch very little news. I watch mostly local news and occasionally, and this is about education, see? <laughs> Occasionally, I'll watch some of the national news or whatever. But guess what? When you are educated, you pick and choose what comes into your house, what comes into your mind, what you share with others. And you can do that by making sure that you don't just take anything and anybody at its word, even down to me. I don't know if you guys can see this. Brown and root, I mean, root and branch. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been saying Brown versus Board of Education so much. 
Brown and root. I mean, root and branch. Oh, God. <laughs> root and branch. This is Charles Hamilton Houston, Thurgood Marshall, and the struggle to end segregation. I met this young man, Ron James, who wrote this book. I encourage you to get this book because it really walks you through the work that had to be done in order for us to break down many of the barriers. It's called education. One of the barriers was being mistreated in the education system. Well, now we put our kids in this so-called great public education system, mm -hmm. and we find that our children are still being mistreated. So I want to encourage you today, if you're not a member of your local branch of the NAACP, join the NAACP. They are constantly training, constantly training to help us get the information that we need. Again, today is about Brown v. Board of Education, education excellence, education equity. This brings me to the close of the show. It was so wonderful talking with you today. And please join us next week, same time, 12 noon, every Thursday for GA for Justice. Ain't no doubt about it. Once again, we had a great topic and education excellence, education equity. And it's important because our future generation is at stake. With all this gun violence going on, they just trying to disrupt the education of our community. But once again, George Allen brings it home with the, the knowledge and wisdom that you'll be able to talk amongst yourselves and your kids. And don't forget every Thursday, GA for Justice with uh, community activist, Georgia Allen. She's right here from 12 until one. And once again, I do apologize for the technical difficulty, but hey, when we talk it is always gonna be a problem. <laughs> until next Thursday. This is WBDM and GA for Justice saying good evening. Good evening. <laughs>